Israel strikes Gaza and Lebanon after it raided the Al-Aqsa Mosque. There are fears the unrest will spread across the region. So what will it take to de-escalate tensions? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to Inside Story. I'm Nick Clark. From Lebanon to Gaza and the occupied West Bank, there's been a sharp increase in violence between Palestinians and Israelis. It's raised fears of a wider confrontation and questions around what this means for the already tense situation. In Gaza, the Israeli military says it carried out airstrikes on Hamas positions after intercepting rockets fired from the region. There are no reports of casualties. Israel has also carried out airstrikes on parts of southern Lebanon. The military says it's in response to rockets fired into Israel on Thursday. Witnesses say the missiles fell into an open area near a Palestinian refugee camp, damaging homes and farmland. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu promised a strong response. I've made it very clear that our enemy shouldn't test us. The internal struggle in Israel won't stop us from responding wherever and whenever necessary. We're calling for calm and we will act against the extremists who resort to violence. As for the aggression against us on other fronts, we will strike our enemies and they will pay a price for any act of aggression. Our enemy will discover once again that in moments of truth, the citizens of Israel stand united and unified and support the actions of the army and the security forces to defend our country and our citizens. In the occupied West Bank, two Israeli women have been killed and another seriously injured in the shooting. Israeli authorities say the attackers targeted a vehicle in the West Bank. Local media are reporting the victims are a mother and her two daughters. Hamas says the attack is a natural response to the raids on Al-Aqsa this week. Hussam Zomlot, Palestine's ambassador to the UK, had this to say. This is the Israeli playbook for 75 years, that is, since its establishment. A playbook uh, that goes like this. Uh, uh, they provoke the Palestinian people into provoking them, so they retaliate. Israel has been provoking and provoking over the, over the months, the, the weeks, the days, in Jenin, in Nablus, in Hebron, in Gaza, they blockaded Gaza. And then, of course, the peak of that provocation, as Israel knows very well, is Al-Aqsa uh, 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 al-Sharif, al-Haram al-Sharif, uh, as uh, happened uh, the last uh, few nights during the holy month uh, uh, of Ramadan. And this playbook goes like this because Israel lives on violence. It lives on the oppression and subjugation of an entire nation. All right, let's bring in our panelists. In Ramallah, we're joined by Noor Day, who's a political analyst and former spokeswoman for the Palestinian National Authority. In Tel Aviv, in Israel, is Uri Dromi, who's the founder and president of the Jerusalem Press Club and a former Israeli government spokesman. And in Tunis, Francesca Albanese, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories. Welcomes Welcome to all of you. Uh, Nora, I'd like to start with you first of all. There is a, a, a tragic familiarity to all of this, isn't there? Worshippers at a deeply sacred site beaten, rocket attacks, reprisals, deaths. It is just a relentless cycle, and here we go again. Well, yeah, it's relentless and it's never ending because uh, none of the uh, factors change. And the, and the one factor that has remained uh, quite constant is the fact that Israel can get away with all of it. It can get away with remaining an occupying power. It can get away with entering and, and raiding and storming Al-Aqsa Mosque and uh, uh, undermining the historic and, and legal status quo in Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa specifically uh, without any consequence. And so it doesn't feel any incentive to change course, to let go of the Palestinian people, to let go of that occupation. And it has set up uh, the set the stage really for a very violent month. Uh, I remember from as far as the beginning of the year, Israel was warning about Ramadan as if Ramadan was somehow a month where all Palestinians turn into werewolves. When the fact is that all these Israeli deliberate provocations and restrictions um, um, uh, produce a very tense situation that can, and as we've seen, has spiraled uh, um, into further. 
uh, violence and further brutality, unfortunately. Uh, Nora, is that your sense of where this is going, of escalating violence? Well, look, I have to remind the viewers the reality under occupation is violent every day. So when we talk about an escalation, we're talking about an uptick in the violence that Palestinians experience every day. I don't think that we are headed into an all-out confrontation, but I do think that the situation remains, remains very, very precarious. And the more Israel pushes Palestinians in Jerusalem and across the occupied West Bank, and the more heat... Palestinians in Gaza feel the more likely, unfortunately, uh, is that things might deteriorate even further. Uri Dromi in Tel Aviv, given the tensions, why would Israeli forces go in such a heavy handed way into the place of worship that is the Al Aqsa Mosque? Uh, frankly, I have uh, some bit of criticism of the way our police handled it. But let's put it in a perspective. I mean, Israel since 67 has kept the freedom of religion uh, at Al-Aqsa Mosque. And uh, uh, with all the problems and the wars and the violence, uh, this principle was kept really rigorously by, by all Israeli government. Uh, the problem is that there are forces, and mainly Hamas at the time, which try to use the sacred place, sacred to both uh, Jews and Muslims, uh, to to spark a, spark a, another wave of violence in the region, and and uh, the violence you saw uh, two days ago at Alaska Mosque. Uh, really resulted from the fact that some 300 people went into the mosque armed with clubs and stones and what have you. And I don't think most people go that way to a uh, synagogue or to a uh, mosque or to a church. So the police had to uh, react. And uh, as I said the, at the beginning, it reacted a bit uh, uh, hard, harshly than necessary, but... but that, that, um, that's a very point, isn't it? They, they went in more harshly than is necessary, uh, and yeah, now yeah. we're in the situation okay. that we're in, which is escalation. Look, if, if, if we're starting again the, the, the blame game, who started what, uh, fine. All I'm saying is, look at the, at the broad picture. <laughs> the broad picture is that every Friday... Uh, tens of thousands, if not more, uh, Muslim worshippers go to the uh, to Temple Mount and pray and go back. Uh, we had a problem there. As I said, it resulted from uh, a group of people who came there to start a, a, tr a trouble, not to pray. And we had to uh, handle it. We handled it. Wow. it. Okay, Nora, just jump in there. I, I, I don't want to get into a tit for tat about what happened, mm -hmm. but really, I, I think sticking to facts is extremely important. Is the Israeli police has no business and no right being inside Al Aqsa? It has no business restricting Palestinians and deciding who can enter the Al Aqsa Mosque and for how long. And the fact is, there is a tradition, a religious tradition, to stay at Al Aqsa, to stay overnight at Al Aqsa. Uh, uh, praying and 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 interest in, in introspection, and Israel wanted to restrict that, wanted to stop that, ban that. So the fact that some Palestinians may have uh, been, uh, you know, apprehensive about a possible uh, clash with the Israeli uh, security forces, with the Israeli occupation forces, sorry, uh, is not because they were looking for trouble, is because they knew it was going to happen, because Israel had been raiding Al-Aqsa for days. Uh, this was no surprise. This is the modus operandi of the occupation. And to say that Israel has respected religious freedom is really, uh, you know, and I want to stay respectful here and I don't want to gear off point, but that's just factually incorrect and all international reports refute that. When okay. you restrict, when you say that Palestinians under 30 or 45 cannot go to Jerusalem, you are restricting the right to freedom of religion. When you decide 
who can enter and who cannot. When you ban people from Al-Aqsa and from the old city, then you're not respecting their rights okay, to no. freedom of religion. You're not respecting their I human jump rights. In there, no. so that's just I just want to right move on. We, we haven't yet heard from Fra Francesca Albanese, who's the United Nations yeah. Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories. Uh, Francesca, what's your sense of, of where we're at now, the overall situation? How serious is it? Uh, I uh, I think it's very serious, but let me add on what uh, the other uh, speakers were saying. I think that Israel's recent attacks on Al-Aqsa were reckless and beyond violating um, the basic human rights of the Palestinians, including the rights to worship and, the and causing damage to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. They uh, violate the status quo agreement, which Israel is under obligation to respect. And in this sense, yes, there is no reason for the police to, to go to go in. And so uh, these attacks are neither unprecedented nor nor isolated. I agree with Israeli speakers that the context matters. And the context is that of an abusive occupation which operates outside what is permitted by international by international law. So it's not a tit for tat, it's not something that started this week. This year, or even in 2022 or in 2021, it's a reality where the Palestinians endure uh, confinement, land confiscations, home demolitions, discriminatory law enforcement, mass incarceration, and other countless abuses and indignities and humiliations. So the violence is only uh, doomed to, to continue unless this irredeemable illegality is, uh, is fixed. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I just want to unpick it a bit, Nick, because we I, have this thing... Just, uh, Uri, Nick, just very quickly just, jump back to that, very quickly, yeah. Very quickly, if, if uh, uh, Francesca agrees with me about the context, let's broaden it a bit further and say that we came up with the Oslo uh, initiative, which might have uh, finished the occupation, and the Palestinians said no. So, and, and now uh, <laughs> they are victimizing themselves uh, forever. So uh, this is where we are. Uh, okay, let, let's. I just wanted to get it back to what's happened in the last few yeah. days. I want to unpick that. Yeah, but so just one point. Thursday, just one point. Yeah, hold, because, uh, Fra Francesca, the right to, uh, one the right second. I'm going to come, I'm gonna come back to you. Cannot be infringed. Yeah. I'm going to come back to you in a second. You'll have plenty of opportunity to talk. Uh, but no. So Thursday we have the Israeli military once again attacking worshippers in Al Aqsa. And then we have dozens of rockets being fired in from Lebanon into Israeli territory, biggest escalation since 2006. For our audience, tell us about who fired those rockets and why from Lebanon? Well, we don't know who fired the rockets. There have been no claims of responsibility as far as I uh, uh, I know. Uh, Israel accused Hamas, even though Hamas is not based in Lebanon, um, and it responded by re by uh, bombarding the Gaza Strip, which it still uh, considered an occupying power of. It is a land that is besieged by Israel since 2006. And it also uh, bombarded southern uh, Lebanon. Um, the, the, the idea that an escalation, that, uh, that these scenes of brutality can happen in Jerusalem while uh, Palestinians look on, uh, while uh, people see that there is this entrenched culture of impunity, of no consequence, um, is absurd. Israel continues to insist that it can do whatever it wants in Jerusalem, and it expects Palestinians everywhere else to be quiet and mute. And that has proven folly. And as Francesca said, while this brutality continues, it is unrealistic to expect Palestinians not to respond. Um, so we saw that escalation in southern Lebanon. I don't think there is any verifiable way to see, to know who fired the rockets, and I don't think it really matters uh, because it is obvious from the way Israel re reacted that there is no um, nobody seeking an all-out confrontation. The easiest uh, target for Israel uh, is the Palestinians. It can target them and brutalize them without any consequence, without getting any regional actors. Uh, involved, and so it has done that, and it will continue to do that as long as it can get away with it. That's just the brutal, brutal reality of it. Uh, and, and the easy fix for, for, those, really for those who may not know about that the occupation, Oslo or not. All right, Francesca, for those who don't know the history, how does Hezbollah fit into the picture? And they may not have been responsible for these rocket attacks, but they would have known about it, right? 
Yeah, just one point uh, to, to answer briefly the, 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 the question before. Sure. Uh, whatever the agreements, the agreements cannot infringe the right of self-determination of any people, including the Palestinians. And now, um, the, 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 let's say, previous previous violence unleashed against the Palestinians uh, at Al-Aqsa in 2021-2022 have caused tensions with military groups in Gaza. Now the situation is worse because there, there have been indiscriminate attacks is launched by southern Lebanon as well, the largest attack from Lebanon since 2006. I cannot say uh, who ba was behind it, but I, I could condemned all attacks on civilians. Civilians must be protected, and there are principles of proportionality and distinctions that are cardinal and intransgressible in international law. But again, the context um, is that of, uh, of an escalation that was predictable, and Israel had the means not to not to trigger it. And this is, uh, this is a question that we should all uh, reflect upon. The asymmetry of power between between Israel and Palestinian groups can also uh, should also be considered. I mean, when it, when we talk about the indiscriminate attacks against against the civilians, the the occupation the occupation is the trigger to this violence, and it's not an occupation maintained for security reasons. I'm sorry. Otherwise, why would have uh, it translated into the creation of uh, over 270 colonies in the occupied land and the uh, and the transfer or over seven seven hundred twenty thousand Israeli civilians. This is what we should be talking about because this is the trigger of the violence uh, with uh, with the Palestinians. Uri, do you want to come back to that? This is the trigger that inevitably. Uh... The resistance is going to come if uh, the Palestinians are treated in this way. Well, the difference between the way Israel uh, defends itself and the way the Palestinians feel they are defending their uh, cause is that Israel tries, uh, goes out of its way not to hit civilians. And, uh, and, and uh, I can tell you, I can tell you, as a former Air Force colonel, that uh, many times when the pilots or, or people who operate uh, unmanned vehicles, they, they stop, they don't launch the missile or something because some uninvolved people are around. On the, on the contrary, what we saw today uh, in the West Bank is uh, some Palestinians uh, killing brutally and intentionally uh, two sisters and uh, critically uh, wounding uh, uh, their mother. And I'd, I'd, I didn't hear anything uh, from the other two speakers about this. So that's the difference. I mean, we try but not my question to, to you, My question to you, Uri, was, was more about the, the trigger for all this violence, one way or the other. It, it's, it comes down to the root cause, which is the occupation. The, tri uh, the, 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 the continuation of the occupation is a result of the continuous rejectionism of Palestinians to any peace settlement. And we came up with, oh my God. with the Oslo Accords and with with the with Camp David in 2000. And and still they they, they keep saying no and no. And this is what happens. I'm fr frankly, personally, I'm not uh, for uh, settling the West Bank with Jews. I would rather stay in Israel proper. But when you have uh, on the other side a partner, which uh, even doesn't take yes for an answer, uh, it's a problem. OK. Noor, respond to that, if you will. I mean, where do I begin? But let me just remind the viewers, because there's been so much Hasbara uh, in the past few minutes, that Israel has killed thousands of Palestinian civilians. It has destroyed entire residential buildings. It has targeted the press. It has downed an entire building housing Al Jazeera and AP in Gaza. It killed our colleague and friend Shirin Abu Akli in Jenin. So when we're talking about the Israeli army, let's keep that in perspective, the a plethora of evidence about targeting civilians, about wiping entire families of the population registry are abundant and they can be found very easily. They're readily uh, available. Uh, to say that Palestinians reject uh, freedom and self-determination and that's why Israel must occupy them is an old line. 
Uh, it seems that some think that it does, doesn't get old, but it really, really is old uh, and used. And it's also nonsensical. Uh, the Palestinian right to be free uh, of Israeli domination, of Israeli brutalization is absolute. And uh, to uh, excuse the commission of war crimes, which is what building settlements and transferring uh, the occupier's population is, um, it is simply laughable. Uh, Israel could end its occupation if it were interested. But you have a government now that is committed to not just decimating the Palestinian people, but to treating the entirety of historic Palestine as the land of Israel, to denying the existence of the Palestinian people, to denying their very own humanity. You have ministers who are responsible for controlling the lives of Palestinians who have been convicted even in Israel for uh, being provocateurs, for attacking uh, Israeli security, for attacking Palestinians, and they're inviting a lot of these pogroms and a lot of these uh, attacks by Israeli settlers against Palestinian civilians and by Israeli occupation okay. authorities against uh, Palestinian civilians. This is not uh, a case of Palestinian uh, Palestinians who want to remain occupied so they can remain violent. That's a very racist um, uh, idea to present, uh, quite frankly. Um, uh, the the okay. continuation let, let just, of the occupation. Let's, let's, let's move it on. No, no. Let's yeah, move it on. Just Francesca, just we, the, the bottom line is little's going to change without a massive international effort. Um, Francesca, what do you make of the response to the al Aqsa provocations? The Canadian Prime Minister calling on Israel to shift its approach from, from the violence seen at al Aqsa, but there was little else, really. Uh, would you call for more international condemnation and, and what more needs to be done for, say, the United States? Yes, it's clear that mere words of condemnation do not work. Um, do not work anywhere, particularly here, where, again, I want to stress uh, uh, for the viewers that the relationship is not a symmetrical one between uh, two, um, two equal entities or countries. There is one, one people and one state occupying another with a significant asymmetry uh, of, of, of forces and power in, um, in, uh, coming, into, coming into play. Instead of acquiescing to these uh, state of affairs and calling for negotiations between the occupier and the occupied, the international community should simply abide by international law. And so do not recognize the illicit act, the internationally wrongful act committed by Israel, and do not cooperate or extend um, recognition of, of this of the colonization of the occupied territory, um, and also ask for cessation and reparations for this illegal act. But also in the, in the current reality, it's absolutely necessary to deploy a protective presence that guarantees the safety and security of all civilians, first and foremost the Palestinians, because they are the most exposed to the violence, but also, also the, the Israelis. But again, this should lead uh, as a long-term solution to the dismantlement of the occupation and the dismantlement of the colonization that Israel maintains over the occupied territory, because this is not in line with international law. Uri, I, just to, I want to come back to Noor's point about the, the current government, and it's fair to say, isn't it, that the right-wing elements, they do nothing to reduce tensions like uh, the ministers uh, Smotrich and Ben Gvir? I don't subscribe to anything they say. Sorry, please continue. I don't subscribe to anything they stand for or say. And uh, there's a democracy in Israel. Unfortunately, they won the elections. But now, recently, we have, uh, because they started, they launched a, uh, a motion to really move Israel from being democracy. Uh, the majority of the Israeli people is uprising against it, and I think it will reflect itself uh, in the next elections. But but I really was uh, a bit annoyed by what the, the the speaker from the UN said, and 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 frankly, we're talking about a big perspective. It's about time that the UN starts to look at the Palestinian problem uh, and try to uh, really solve it. Because the, the, the UN has this UNRWA, which perpetuates the, uh, 
the situation of the of the Palestinian refugees instead of uh, solving and settling it, and instead of encouraging them to join uh, the members of the Abraham Accords who move forward with Israel rather than uh, being stuck in the, in the past. Okay, Uri, let's throw that back to Francesca, which is coming right to the end of the program. So, Francesca, if you could wrap it up pretty quick, thanks. Uh, yes, I mean, I agree again that the UN should take responsibility for the question of Palestine, which is a responsibility for the UN, uh, and it has been so for 75 years. But this doesn't, doesn't uh, cannot happen without, again, ending the occupation, because right now, this is the main problem that needs to be resolved. And Noor, so final word to you, Noor, ending the occupation, that's the only solution. Yes, and Jerusalem will remain the epicenter of events at this point uh, because Israel is deliberately uh, provoking. As long as there is this occupation that continues and as long as Palestinian refugees continue to be denied their right to return to their homes, and as long as you have people who are willing to dehumanize Palestinians and attack them for demanding freedom, uh, without feeling shame or without facing consequence, um, it is unlikely that we will see any uh, change in the dynamics, unfortunately. All right, on that note, we'll leave it. Uh, thanks very much indeed to our guests, uh, to Ode, Uri Dromi and Francesca Albanese. Thanks very much indeed. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again at any time by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, just go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark, and the whole team here in Doha, it's goodbye for now.